This is Rollin Kearns interviewing Dr. Irene E. Mitchell at Oklahoma College of Liberal Arts, Chickasha, Oklahoma, on October 27, 1971. Dr. Mitchell is a long time resident, I believe born in Oklahoma, and I will now turn the microphone over to her to say whatever she would care to. Dr. Mitchell. 1952. I began uh, researching the 100 years history of Bloomfield, first under the direction of Dr. Morris Wardell at the University of Oklahoma, and the research was completed under Dr. Edwin McReynolds. Bloomfield Academy was a girls' school established in 1852 uh, for the Chickasaw Indians. This was under the auspices of the Methodist Mission Board. As the missionaries began to come into Chickasaw country in Indian Territory, they found a wonderful, rich country. This seemed like a promised land to the missionaries who believed that here in the bosom of the earth lay untold riches, but for them the greater wealth was to be found in the lives of the Indians among whom they had chosen to work. A petition from the Chickasaw Indians was presented to the 7th Indian Mission Conference at the Choctaw Agency, November the 7th, 1850, by Reverend John H. Carr, a Methodist circuit rider. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Carr was assigned to superintend the construction of a Chickasaw Indian Mission School. Its name was chosen in a most unique way. Mr. Jackson Kemp, the school trustee asked where to address Reverend Carr's mail, and the minister, looking over the field of prairie fl flowers, beautiful in an array of vivid colors, answered, oh, let's call it Bloomfield. After the building was planned and the construction had begun, Reverend Carr, in the summer of 1852, went east and secured the services of two young women who had graduated from Mount Holyoke Seminary at Bedford, Massachusetts. They were missionaries among the Choctaws and Chickasaws for many years. Both Miss Susan Jane Johnson and Miss Angelina Hosmer were experienced teachers. The first year Bloomfield opened, boys and girls both attended the neighborhood school. And again, during the Civil War and the Reconstruction period, the girls' school became a primary school and coeducational. But early in the history of Bloomfield, the Reverend Carr and the faculty developed an unusually progressive curriculum. Subjects were taught which included philosophy, botany, logic, and geography. The girls were taught homemaking. They were required to uh, sing and play an instrument, to uh, have elocution lessons, and to do uh, art. From the very early days at Bloomfield, this was the common practice. They were instructed to sew beautifully and were as ready and willing in the domestic labors as they were in their literary achievements. After the Civil War, the Chickasaw Nation adopted a new constitution, and Section 3 on education in part said, and I read it from my thesis that I did, the legislature shall encourage by all suitable means the promotion of intellectual, scientific, moral, and agricultural improvement, and each other means as shall be invulnerable appropriate to the support of general education throughout the nation. Again, in the Choctaw newspaper, The Vindicator, published in 1873, I should like to read in part to show the importance of Bloomfield. The article said, published June the 14th, 1873, a report to the editor, send all your children to schools that could be carried on in a manner that would reflect honor on the nation. Besides conferring a lasting good upon the rising generation, and in their belief we ask the help and support of every sober thinking mind of our country, let us inaugurate schools that will elevate our children to an equal footing with our young white brethren and thus increase their taste for monopolizing and hankering after territory. <laughs> Again, Governor Benjamin C. Burney addressed the Chickasaw legislature in 1879, and this again shows the great importance they put upon education. 
Education is the lever by which our people are to be raised to a mental level with our surroundings, and I desire to impress seriously upon you how important it is that you use your influence in getting our people to see to the education of the young. But we turn our attention now to what is known as the golden era of Bloomfield from 1885 to 1905. And this began under the leadership of Douglas H. Johnston, who later served as the last governor of the Chickasaw Nation. During this period, Bloomfield developed from a boarding school for girls to a finishing school and was often referred to as the Bryn Mawr of the West. The graduates enjoyed a measure of prestige warranted by the high standards established. Their diplomas were sufficient proof of their ability to teach school within the Chickasaw Nation without the usual uh, competitive examination. The school was the seat of culture in Southern Indian Territory and used progressive methods in teaching the arts. During the Louisiana Purchase Exposition and World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904, the art department of Bloomfield Academy received the highest reward, award. I'd like to read a little of the requirement for graduation. The requirement for graduation requirements were rigid and the girls at Bloomfield Academy were required to take written and oral final examinations in all the subjects in which they were enrolled. Many weeks were spent in reviewing and preparing for the public exercises, at which time the parents and the friends were allowed to question the students and assist in conducting the examination. At the, what time this public examination was replaced by the more traditional graduation exercise is unknown. However, each member of the graduating class of 1897 uh, was required to write an original essay and deliver this uh, treatise at the commencement exercise. Now, this is where the story uh, 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 changes a little bit because I had the unique experience of discovering uh, a very wonderful person who had graduated during the golden era of Bloomfield uh, in the class of um, 1904. And uh, they were using a combination of the public examination and the reading of their uh, original essays at this time. Perhaps uh, we could now turn our attention to uh, the one <coughs> graduate uh, that I'm most concerned with because the material that we researched uh, has never been uh, recorded until this time. And I think perhaps uh, Bertie, uh, Helen Bertie Smith, uh, who was Mrs. Ed Butler's daughter, Pauline Hughes would like to uh, tell something about her mother. This is Roland Kearns again, and we will continue the, this little interview by uh, turning the microphone over to Mrs. Pauline B. Hughes, who was referred to just a moment ago by Dr. Mitchell. Ms. Hughes. Uh, Helen Bertie Smith, she was born February the 15th in 1884. Her parents were Woodford T. Smith, who was birth was December the 23rd, 1855, in Hart County, Kentucky. He passed away March the 24th, 1907, near Duncan, Oklahoma. Her mother, <coughs> Serena Cheadle Smith, was born December the 5th, 1860, at Lebanon, Oklahoma. She passed away November the 1st, 1901, near Melbourne, Oklahoma. Her father was superintendent of the Collins Institute. She had four sisters and four brothers, two sisters, of whom are, <coughs> of whom are still living. She's a Chickasaw Indian. Her roll number is 4293. She was, her education was at Bloomfield Seminary. She graduated in 1904. She was valedictorian of her class of six. Her address was Peace on Earth. She specialized in drama and music. 
For her graduation exercises, there were five pianos going at one time, of which she played the invitation to a dance. A piano quartet was also the Grand March. She was one of the four. There were only six graduates, Ramona Bynum, Myrtle Connor, Jane Newberry, Charlotte Goforth, Lucy Young, who was the salutatorian, who was Mother's best friend, and Bertie Smith. Uh, Eli, Hugh, Eli Hugh B. Henshaw was superintendent of the school at the time. Martin Cheadle, who was an uncle, was superintendent of public instructions of the Chickasaw Nations. He delivered the address. He was also a trustee of the school. Douglas Johnston, governor of the Chickasaws, was a cousin. Mrs. William Murray, wife of former governor of Oklahoma, also was a cousin. Also, Mrs. Murray was a teacher at the school. She was married to Gavin Edward Butler on September the 12th, 1904, at Marietta, Oklahoma. Thank you, Ms. Hughes, for a very interesting recital. And now I believe um, we will go back to uh, Dr. Mitchell, who has some further information on the early days of the school. Dr. Mitchell. Again, I'd like to return to the golden era of Bloomfield, where the curriculum was equal to the course of study offered in a present-day junior college. And the girls were allowed to choose their courses from a variety of subjects, such as logic, chemistry, astronomy, botany, typing, art, elocution, and music. The girls of the graduating class during the early 1900s selected a costume that appeared to be standard apparel for a number of classes. They were full, wide gored skirts of, green, of black sage that were ankle length, revealing only a small portion of the black high button shoes that were in vogue. The graduates were fashion plates of loveliness in their long sleeved, elaborate tucked waist of white lawn, styled with high collars trimmed with bands of black velvet ribbon for the gala occasions. Highly decorative belts were worn by the girls and these completed their costume. Perhaps I might also tell you that the uh, campus at Bloomfield was unusually beautiful. Uh, it was lands they had landscaped gardens uh, in formal design. There was a lake. There were uh, bridal paths. And at one time, uh, the school owned a number of beautiful peacocks. So you see, this was the cultural center of Indian territory. Now, I'd like to spend some time uh, discussing uh, one graduate of Bloomfield, Helen Birdie Smith. Uh, during the time she was a junior or senior, we're not quite sure, uh, she was asked to give a talk to the younger girls, and she was to express her ideas on dating. And I should like to read in part, a uh, part of this little talk she had written out. You must always be thinking about what you are doing when young men are about. You must mind how you throw out your bouquets and rosettes and fillets, or you will find yourself like minnas in muddy waters. In fact, it is the easiest thing in the world for some chaps to think they can court you if you don't give them a switch rearward once in a while. All Christendom can't keep them from thinking because your body is in their presence that your heart is there also. You may appear as lovely as liquid bloom and lily white can make a young lady of the period, but you must not be peering at a pair of whiskers over the edge of a feathery fan. If they catch you napping, first thing you know, they will have you labeled with their image. In fact, courtship is something like fishing. You throw out the baited hook, Soon the excited cork bobbling up and down elicits bright anticipation that you will in a moment draw up a beautiful sunny pearl of the deep and lo, you swing out one of the ugliest moss-backed stump narrative monsters of creation just as ugly in his form and you will never let loose till it thunders. <laughs> Keep your eyes open, but it won't do to trust too much appearances either. 
If a young man calls at your pause, whose business you can very well guess some cold Saturday evening and looks into the face of something like a heated furnace, you get some of the little fellows to feel about his overcoat pocket or look under the buggy seat to see if there is not a terrapin-shaped bottle there with something in it as strong as Samson. In a word, as he passes the door, he leaves an odor something likened to cloves drowned in a whiskey barrel. <laughs> Some men's souls seem to be very low down, even down in a slick pair of boots. If you will watch such a one quite close, you will find he has a peculiar attachment for some domestic affairs. He has a wonderful liking about how his mother does things. Depend upon it, you will have to do just like she does, and you'll never know what sort of condition you're in till you find yourself awfully uh, tiddled over the narrow track of domestic expenditure. I say he won't do, and if you'll sail around Cape Lookout again, you'll find he is actually tied to his mama's apron strings and goes whining to her for advice. All is not gold that glitters either. That butterfly-looking fellow that dazzles out in society as polished as a looking glass shines from bottom to top, but on the other side, he is a perfect quicksilver. He is a domestic caterpillar, a moth, moody, exacting, you'll not know him at home. There is another kind of disease, quite puzzlesome, sometimes running at the rate, as sailors say, of ten knots an hour, known as contrariness. Some of them would sometimes be quite a jewel, a good grab, if it uh, wasn't for that. Uh, but it's like Miss Murison. The fit gets on them, and they seem to be all insensible of the missionary inflicted. Such occasions um, always look to be with magnified anticipation as a sort of an anniversary millium for flatters and flirts continually tugging at your heartstring with their sickle formalities. They won't do either. They make a sensible person think of a dose of castor oil, pretty and slick, but the very mischief to take. Courtship. Flattery, flirtation, and jealousy makes quite a cautious compound, and the young lady that analyzes them without being strained with either ingredient is indeed a very expert chemist. I might say, as I read this, I put emphasis upon the place that she had uh, drawn lines to show that in her talk she was going to emphasize it. <laughs> Again, uh, let me remind you that Bertie uh, Smith uh, was a very popular member of her graduating class. And uh, the girls uh, spent many, many weeks preparing for this all-day celebration. The people came by the hundreds uh, down to Bloomfield, which was uh, on a prairie uh, north of Denison, Texas, and south of what is now Durant, Oklahoma. And they came in their surreys, in their uh, wagons on horseback, and sometimes they camped around the campus, but they always were there for the all-day session of the uh, day of graduation. There were exercises all through the morning, a barbecue lunch, and then the afternoon was the graduation itself. There had been a terrible storm in the latter part of May of 1904, and according to the newspaper reports out of Denison, Texas, the crowd that normally came for this uh, graduation exercise was cut. But there was upwards of 400 people as guests of the college uh, that day. Uh, Thursday of the day of graduation, the entire day was given to the entertainment of the guest and the program for the commencement exercise. An interesting feature of the morning's program was a contest between two teams of Indian club swingers the members of each club wore halves of rosettes of yellow and black ribbons. At the close of the contest, the visitors, the victors, I'm sorry, were given the colors of the opposing team and were decorated with the full rosette which they had won after the close and spirited contest. Miss Sophia Fry of Ardmore was the captain of the black ribbon class, which won the victory. The yellow ribbon class was captained by Miss Carrie Young of Berwyn. 
The judges of the contest were W.J. Borland, W.R. Hume, and J.W. Johnson. During the morning recess, the two basketball teams gave an interesting exhibition of bas a basketball, which was highly appreciated by the spectators. The game was played on the seminary campus. The remaining of the morning hours were taken up with recitation, reading, and contest. Perhaps I might tell you a, a costume that the uh, girls of Bloomfield normally wore. Uh, the graduating seniors were always allowed to wear a mortarboard cap, uh, a black, and the cap was embroidered with two yellow bees, Bloomfield blossoms. And that was the most cherished thing to these lovely women. And I might tell you, before I finish the discussion of uh, Bertie Smith Butler's graduation valedictorian speech, that I, read, that I read this speech to the remaining women who had been at Bloomfield in 1900 to 1904. In May of 1970, they held what they think may be their last reunion of a, a large number. And although Mrs. Butler, because of her advanced age, was unable to go, she sent her graduation speech. And I read it to these uh, women, and they almost cried with joy as they recalled how they were Bloomfield blossoms. And I might also tell the, you people that 30 years ago, when I began really becoming interested in this school and knowing so many of these wonderful women, I kept asking these Indian women, why are you so eager to preserve culture and make life beautiful in Oklahoma? And they said that every graduating girl from Bloomfield was told, you must go back to your own home and you must leaven the loaf. You must make life beautiful and interesting to everyone that lives there. You have an obligation, they were told, over and over. And of the dozens and dozens of Bloomfield graduates that I have known in my life, not one ever uh, failed to keep that charge. So now I would like to uh, close by explaining how the room was decorated. The exercises for graduation that day at Bloomfield uh, were held in a large room beautifully decorated with the class colors of pink and white and the class flower was a white rose and roses were very much in evidence. The exercise for the afternoon commenced with an innovate in uh, a prayer I can't say by Reverend C.A. Burris delivered in the Chickasaw language. Reverend Burris, according to the newspaper article, was one of the oldest Chickasaws and considered the great orator of the Chickasaw Nation. Then, as Mrs. Hughes has told you, many, many uh, orchestra and choral numbers were given because each girl in the graduating class, as well as the students, must perform. And then M.V. Cheadle of Tishomingo, the superintendent of public instruction of the Chickasaw Nation, delivered an address in which he accorded the faculty great praise for the general tone of excellence established and maintained at Bloomfield, and to which the students bear witness, not only during their school day, but in their afterlife. And so then, in conclusion, uh, I would like to read to you this very beautiful uh, valedictorian speech that Bertie Smith Butler delivered. The girls, as they sat on the stage that day at graduation in 1904, were each wearing a costume that they had themselves designed and made of white Japanese silk material. Uh, these were handmade, ankle length, and identical dresses. And so the graduation speech entitled Peace on Earth. All the good things of the earth first had their birth in the fancy of some idealist. And in spite of the fact that several of the great nations of the world are still engaged in strife, 
The voice of prophecy proclaims that the era of peace is sure to come. We have seen among the most advanced and progressive nations of the earth a growing tendency to submit their disputes to arbitration. And instead of being ambitious to excel at arms, they are seeking commercial and educational supremacy. As it is with the individual, so it is with the nation. As a spirit of peace finds root and flourishes in each individual soul, the possibility of clashes between nations will become more and more remote. Health, happiness, and true success can only exist either for the individual or for the nation where peace and harmony can rule. The man who hates his brother or seeks to injure him is sure to reap a harvest of sorrow because he is, in viol he is violating the great law of peace and friendship. As we come more and more under the influence of the one law and give up our individual lives more and more fully to its influence, we see clearly that the best interest of one are bound up with the good of the whole. Education in the laws of life is the great promoter of peace and well-being. Men must be taught the oneness of all life and the spirit of altruism must be aroused in them. They must be shown that the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man is something more than a figure of speech, that it has a scientific foundation and is going to become an actuality upon this earth. The first and foremost instinct of man on the animal plane is self-preservation. But as he advances in spiritual unfoldment, he learns that the law proportioned as the nations of the earth come to live at peace with each other and to replace jealousy and strife with true helpfulness and cooperation. They will find themselves developing true strength and permanency. For in harmony in all its forms is temporal while peace and harmony are eternal. With universal peace, we can be one great and loving nation. The grandest enterprises may be carried forward, our loftiest aspirations may be reached, and our highest ambitions realized. Peace has its own peculiar victories in the comparison with which Marathon and Bannockburg and Bunker Hill fields which are, which are shall lose their luster. In all times to come may the grandeur of men be discerned, not in the bloody victories nor in revengeance conquest, but in the blessings which they shall secure, in the good they shall accomplish, and in the establishment of perpetual peace. Dear parents, it is through your agency and inducement that we, the class of 1904, have reached this day, a day which will be a remarkable period within our lives. Kind teachers, we hope you have not labored in vain to make women of us of which our country will be proud. We appreciate your kind words of advice and the interest you have manifested in us. Dear loving schoolmates, we have been a joyful, happy band, and now that the day has come for us to part, let us remember each other kindly and try to make use of the great lessons we have learned. Now to all, farewell, farewell to Bloomfield, the pride of all true Bloomfield blossoms. I'm impressed by the, uh, your reminiscences on the striving for peace clear back in 1904, and also I could not help but contrast the garb of the graduates of that day with the garb of the graduating class here at OCLA today. I was just curious as to whether uh, Bloomfield is still an active college. Could you comment on that, please, Dr. Mitchell? No, uh, it's a long, long story of how uh, Bloomfield began to um, feel the pressure put upon the uh, educators uh, to change the school from a finishing school uh, to meet the needs and interest of the students. And gradually, uh, monies uh, were uh, taken away from the school. And uh, they ha were uh, bothered by very devastating fires. And um, finally, in 1905, they had struggled for, uh, uh, see, eight years after statehood. 
And in 1905, uh, the very beautiful uh, building of Bloomfield was destroyed by fire. And at that time, the trustees decided that they would not rebuild. So the faculty and uh, some uh, of the school was moved to Ardmore, just out of Ardmore. And it was renamed for Congressman Carter. And it is today Carter Se uh, Seminary. Now, of course, it has also, since 1905, gone through very many changes. Uh, today, at the very present time, it is uh, simply dormitories for the Indian boys and girls who are brought from all over the United States. And they are from either broken homes or uh, deprived of the various privileges. Uh, these children are put in there because they are half orphaned or they need some special kind of supervision. But they do attend the public school. They are given a uh, chance to uh, take music and art and uh, to participate in sports out on the campus itself. And it's a very lovely campus north of Ardmore. But the students are taken into the public school of Ardmore today. Again, thank you, Dr. Mitchell and Ms. Hughes, for some very interesting commentaries and reminiscences of the old Bloomfield College. This concludes this interview. <laughs>